uh, we're about to hear from Impossible Foods. Normally, you'd look at these two companies, you'd say they were competitors, but in fact, they're collaborators. They are both the progenitors of a new movement, and in my opinion, they represent excellent examples of socially oriented capitalism, where doing well and doing good can converge. So our next speaker is Nick Halla from Impossible Foods. Thank you, Moses. I think that was a really good preview for what we're all trying to do. And it's going to take a lot of people to drive the changes that we need to, need to drive. So I'm going to make this a bit interactive, so don't uh, be afraid to yell out answers. And I'll start with a question. What decision, do we make, or what decision do we make every day that has the single biggest impact on the environment and climate change? Exactly. It's kind of previewed by what I'm talking about, but yeah, you're exactly right. Most people, when they think about it, they think about driving to work or turning electricity on in their home, but it is. It's what we eat. So I'm going to tell you a story of how we went from a moonshot idea to Impossible to create a completely new platform of technology, how to make delicious food and drive a consumer movement to change the world. So I'm going to start that story out on a farm. So this is a small family dairy farm. This is a place where every cow has a name. This is a place where every one of all ages pitch in and, and help out on the farm, whether it's neighbors, friends, family. And this is my family's dairy farm. So this one right here, that's me. So this is my brothers and sisters and I hosting our kindergarten class out at the farm to teach, teach other kindergartners what farming's like, what it's about. And I wasn't joking that every cow has a name. So our teacher for the class was Mrs. Lewis, and she was a family friend. And she had the special privilege each year of getting to milk a cow, also named Mrs. Lewis. <laughs> but that's a longer story. I'll tell it another time. So this was our way of life and everything that I knew. Um, but I knew I wanted to do something different. So I studied engineering. I worked at General Mills uh, making new products for four years. But when I went back to what I really learned on the farm, I learned I gained this huge passion and drive for environment and sustainability. And so that drove me to go to graduate school and study how to commercialize energy technologies. That's where cool ideas and great technology come together with worldwide impact. For, well, that's what I thought. That was until I met this guy. So this is Dr. Patrick Brown. He was a medical school researcher at Stanford for 25 years. Nothing in food. He would researched cancer, genomics, I mean, he, had, he was one of the world's leading, and is one of the world's leading scientists. And he had his dream job. His description was to create, explore, invent. But none of that mattered when he took a sabbatical looking at, as a biochemist, what's the biggest positive impact he could have on the world? And he realized our reliance on animals for food production was by far the biggest threat to the world's environment. And as a biochemist, he had the skills to work on this. So that really connected with me. Um, it made me change everything that I knew about food, and I joined Pat from day one to help him build this company. And the problem with animal agriculture today, um, as we just learned, is that it just doesn't scale. It worked a 1,000 years ago, but we can't feed the world this way, the 7 billion going on 10 billion people. Today, animal agriculture uses more than 50% of the world's land surface, more than 25% of the fresh water each year, and more greenhouse gases than all transportation combined. But we'll come to another question. Why do you think we eat all this meat and cheese and fish? Marketing? Marketing? It tastes good. It produces absolutely delicious food. And unless we solve that, nothing else is going to change, because people love to bite into that big, juicy burger. So at this point, Pat was looking at this as a biochemist. He's like, we can do the same thing. Um, what animals are good at doing is taking corn, grass, soy, and converting them into the fish, meat, and cheese that we like. But they are extremely inefficient. So if you take a beef cow, for every 33 grams of protein you put into a cow, we consume one gram of protein out as meat. That's a 3% efficient technology. What technologies exist today with a 3% efficiency and are still around? Anything? Probably not. I can never really think of anything either. So when we look back now, as if we go to the primary source, the plants, 
we can create a much more efficient system as long as we meet the properties that consumers want. So at this point, Pat's looking at it and thinking, about, how do I actually do this? Do I go to government and put policies in place and incentivize a system to change, but realize that's a dead end? Do I go to academia, the world that he knew really well, um, but realize that would just be too slow? Does he go to General Mills, the food companies that I was working at, and realize that that's just not the way they think? Even though it is a one and a half trillion dollar industry, the opportunity is massive. It's not the way they approach food. So at that point, he realized the only way to do this is to start a company. And so we started Impossible Foods with one goal, to make uncompromisingly delicious meat, fish, and dairy foods, but much more sustainably, all directly from plants. And the first and most important thing is they have to have that craveability. So our, our minimum bar from day one before we were going to launch any product is that it had to appeal to the hardest core meat-loving consumer out there. And that's what really connected with me. If I go back to the farm again, our role in the world is to make great food for people while preserving our lands for future generations. Now, if we have an opportunity to create more food, better food, while maintaining the land better, this was a complete no-brainer for my family, my neighbors, my friends, and we can incentivize that next generation of agriculture to develop. And we can have such a big impact with that system one of the early models in the company was that we are going to literally change the way the world looks from space. So we talked about those statistics of really what this system drives today from an environmental footprint. We can reduce water pollution and air pollution, free up land to go back into natural habitats, and literally change the way the world looks. So, so far I've talked a lot about like, the history and how we came up with the idea and really the vision of what we're trying to accomplish. Now I'll switch gears a little bit and talk about how do we actually do this? So first, it all starts with team. So this colorful group of folk up here is uh, some of our team back in California. And we knew from the start that we had to create a different type of team than the food industry typically did and what I came from. Out of the first 50 employees, they're almost all basic scientists, engineers, chefs, farmers, looking at the fundamentals of what makes that system what it is so we could create that next generation. Now we're more than 150, and over half of the team is really on the development side, the creation side, how to do this, because it's a very complex problem. And the first task we had to do was start building this platform I'm talking about. So we have to understand, what actually gives steak its aroma and its flavor when you put it on the grill? Why, when you take mozzarella and you heat it, it stretches and melts and turns so gooey and delicious? And when we learn the drivers of that, then we go in the plant-based world individually pick out the pieces that we need to recreate those properties and deliver the same and better experiences to consumers. And so I'll use an example for how this works. So when we started looking at meat flavor, um, meat flavor itself is extremely complex. When you put a steak on the grill, it's not like you're smelling steak. You're smelling several hundred compounds that are all generated as that material cooks. And if we try to replicate each one of those individually, the solution would be extremely complex, costly, and really not scalable. But as our team dug deeper, they learned there's one magic ingredient that drives everything about meat flavor, and it's a protein called heme. And heme creates all the chemistry that happens. It's, it reacts with amino acids, the vitamins, fatty acids, the simple sugars, to generate all that in situ, so now we don't have to add flavors to the, to the product. It all happens the same way. And so we can create a simple solution in the end. And the best part about this is heme proteins are ubiquitous to life, whether you're a plant or an animal. So we found a heme protein called legume hemoglobin from legumes that drives all the exact same flavor chemistry. So now we can replicate that experience that consumers want. Then we repeated that process with the texture, the handling, the way it cooks, the nutritional benefits to really create all the different properties we need to get from meat. And about two years in, we had enough of these tools that we could start working on our first product. And so the first product was ground beef. So who out there loves a delicious burger? That's most hands up. So we created a new burger for you, the Impossible Burger. So on that note, I'm going to invite my colleague, um, Emily Wood, on stage. And we're gonna, she's going to cook five burgers for us today. Oh, other side. 
So as Emily fires up the grill and gets going, uh, we'll get a camera on the burgers. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the burger and the company. So as you can see here, we have to create a product that has every attribute that you'd expect to get from meat. The way it looks raw, the way it handles, the way it cooks. So we, we created the fat and the muscle and put it together to really make that ground beef product. It has to be delicious, so we'll bring a few people out and toward when Emily is done to have a tasting and see what they think. Uh, this is a product that can be used in anything from meatballs to tacos, tartar even. And it's really just the start of what we're doing. And as we started doing this, um, we, we needed to bring it back to our mission. And so for us, it was all about sustainability. What animals are great at doing are creating products we love, but they're not sustainable. And the Impossible Burger uses approximately 74% less water, 87% less greenhouse gas emissions, and 95% less land we can put back into um, natural habitats. So I talked about the team, how we made a platform, how we make our first product, um, but what do consumers care about? I haven't really talked about what the consumer wants, which really matters the most. And commonly, the first questions we get, and especially with this, you can see that the product itself looks just like ground beef. And the questions we get are, how is that possible? And what's in it? So by breaking it down into the fundamental pieces, we could actually create simple solutions in the end. So the Impossible Burger really has four main components. We have the heme protein I talked about that generates all that amazing flavor and aroma. It has potato protein that takes it from that soft, malleable substance to firm as you cook. Wheat protein that gives it the structure and the chew. And the coconut oil that gives you all that juiciness and that richness. And you put them together, and you get the Impossible Burger. So this is a burger that has more protein and less fat than a burger from a cow. It has no cholesterol, no hormones, no antibiotics. Um, we put all the micronutrients in that people want to get from meat. We have a lot of control from a nutritional standpoint of how we build this product. And this is a burger that's made for the hardcore meat-loving consumers. And that was the design criteria from day one. So as Emily is starting here to get everything ready, um, you can see them cooking. So Emily, how's it going over there? It's great. Can you guys hear the sizzle way back out there? I don't know, is this thing on? Get the sizzle. Yeah, let's see. So as you guys can see, it's releasing a little bit of fat. I can flip one here, it's starting to caramelize and brown. I wish I had a fan behind me so you guys could all smell the meaty smell that's happening up here. But it looks good, Nick. Cool, looks delicious. So we'll, we'll find out. Um, so as she finishes up cooking, we'll have uh, five people come up on stage and do a tasting and we'll get some reactions at the end. So I heard another question out there, which was how many calories? Um, so meat is a calorically dense product and we're more protein, less fat, and we're about calorically the same. And that's that, that satiety that people expect to get from meat is quite important um, as a property. So now we have, we have the product. We're starting to learn what consumers think. Um, but will they actually buy the product? And so we needed to do a test. We, as a scientifically driven company, uh, we went out to 600 consumers across the US and said, here's a plant-based burger. Try it, taste it. What do you think? What do you like? And compared to the burger that you get from a cow, and these are all meat-loving consumers. And in the end, we asked, who prefers, how many people prefer, or do you prefer the, the burger from a cow or the, the burger from the plant, which was unbranded, but it was our product? So what do you think won? Ours did. And this is a straight taste test asking, which one do you prefer? Nope. So the blue line on this graph is the number of people that preferred uh, the Impossible Burger, and the red is the burger from a cow. And remember, these are all meat-loving consumers. And what this taught us was that consumers don't care that their meat comes from a cow. They just want that experience, and that we've actually hit our design criteria. So now we have a product that is meeting the, what meat consumers expect to get from their product. So when we have this product, how do we actually start bringing this to the market? Do we go to Whole Foods and we put it on the shelf and really try to build a consumer movement and build a new category this way, but realize that's not the right place to do it. Do we go to, we're from, our company's out of uh, Redwood City in the San Francisco area, do we go to Apple, Google, Facebook that serve thousands, 10,000s of burgers a day, and we can get feedback really quickly. But, that, but we went back to our mission and what we were trying to do, and we really needed to start a movement and change the way people thought about food. 
And so who do you drive that with? We went to the people that drive consumer trends and influence the food world, the chefs. So in the summer 2016, we launched in New York with David Chang. And David Chang is like the chef of New York and like the meat chef of New York. He, the first time he had the product, he said, I, I think I tasted the future. It's bloody, it's juicy, and it has a meat-like texture. Now we can have something delicious and do good for the planet. And, these, and then we added more chefs, Chris Cosentino, who's known to serve every part of the animal on his menu. Uh, Tracy Desjardins, who is a great French chef and creates an excellent impossible tartare. Um, Brad Farmery and his michelin star restaurant Public, and Chris Croner, who won GQ Best Burger. These are all uh, chefs that put their reputation on the line with every bite that they serve. And they're all extremely excited to serve the Impossible Burger because they know it's now a new product for the consumers and it meets their criteria what they expect. So at this point, it looks like we're getting the burgers um, all prepped. Um, yep, we'd like to invite five people up. I think uh, Moses is going to come join and try a burger. Oh, and the other way. Excellent. Grab one. Take a bite. Hello. So um, since we talked about like taste and deliciousness, this is the prime, prime subjects right here, because tasting is believing. It's a slider, yeah. So as people get their first bites, I'm curious to see uh, what they think. So can people smell the aromas in the audience? Yeah, all right, what do you guys think? What are your initial reactions? Well, I'm a vegetarian, so okay. don't eat meat, and this has the texture of meat, but Love tastes it. amazing. Tastes amazing. Yeah, so this is really cool. That's awesome. It smells awesome, and it tastes even better. <laughs> it's really good. Great, thank you. Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Really yummy. Delicious, this is really good. Uh, it tastes just like meat, actually. <laughs> yeah. I can't it's, it. yeah. It's good. Can you? It's really good. <laughs> so if you hadn't it. been told that that is not meat, would you have believed it was meat? No. I would, know, I would not guess it was meat. You would not. Or I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't guess it wasn't not meat, sorry. <laughs> so you would guess it wasn't not meat. How about you? I wouldn't know. No. Not with any sort the, the, of These are the essential components, right? You want the sizzle, you want the audio, you want the mm. smell, the olfactory, and then the mouth feel. So, um. how does it go? <laughs> it, looks, it even looks like meat. Like, I would mm -hmm. think this was meat and turn it down. So this it is great. Weird. It does make me feel really weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's delicious. <laughs> Just kidding, it's really Thank weird. You. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. The good part, of, like a lot of people do I'm have I'm going to have to share feeling. that with you, Amy. You need to have a bite. Right. Okay. And it's like, once they think about this, it's like, wow, we don't have to get meat from animals. It completely opens up the mind to what we can do. Because now we can actually have delicious burgers, delicious meat, and do something good for the planet at the same time. Sure. Usually, if this were meat, People would say you shouldn't have it medium rare because of all the issues with bacteria. Because this is plant-based, can you have it medium rare and not be worried? So we have a lot of control. It, at the same time, it's a raw product. When Emily started cooking, it is raw. So it's mostly water and full of nutrients. Mm -hmm. And so it's better to cook like any raw food, but it's much safer, much, much safer. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm getting all the special effects, including a certain amount of drip in my yeah. hand. The sloppiness of a burger, it's, like, mm -hmm. it's also an important part of that experience what people expect. Right. So I'll wrap up quickly. Um, as Moses, will come back to your reactions uh, at the end. Um, Impossible, as I talked about from the start, was not built just to make a burger. We wanted to do the entire platform of what animals do. So our team of researchers has first prototypes of anything from beef, steak, chicken, cheese, even bacon. And I think there was a secret mission by Pat, our founder, from the start that all he wanted was a bacon cheeseburger. So uh, you probably guess what's going to come out not in the too far future. We also had a very worldwide mission. We're in Canada. So today we are now in 22 restaurants in the US, in New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Vegas, and recently Houston. Uh, we're completing our first uh, factory right now in Oakland, California, which will take us to more than 1,000 restaurants and more than a, a million burgers every week. And that'll help us expand continue, continually, but still a tiny, tiny fraction. 
And as we look at where we're going to go, meat consumption in Asia is where it's like really heavy and growing. There's big consequences coming behind that. Um, our neighbors here in the north in Canada also consume a lot of meat, and it's part of the economy. And so we can actually create a new agriculture system. And Emily was actually today coordinating a research trial with some farming friends in uh, Canada. Um, but let's close the story by coming back to the farm. So these uh, six kids up here are my nieces and nephews. And I decided that we have to have a barbecue back in Minnesota if this is going to be real. Had my neighbors, friends, and obviously my nieces and nephews over. And gave them burgers, and they all loved it. And my favorite story out of this was Vitaly, the one on the left here in the Star Wars jersey, our shirt, went to school the next day, and they had burgers on the menu. And he told his teacher he didn't want a burger. He only would eat an Impossible Burger. <laughs> Thank you. Nick, we've talked about pretty much everything except price. So if this is going to yep. move into the mainstream, how will a Beyond Burger or an Impossible Burger compare to a Burger Burger? So today, we're in uh, better burger chains like Bear Burger, Umami, Momofuku, Coxcomb, like fancy restaurants. And our price point on the menu is between $12 and $19 for a burger. Uh, US. This is US. And that is very comparable and a lot of times the cheapest thing on the menu. As we get our Oakland plant up and continue, continue to scale, since we're this so much more efficient, as we scale, we should be much more cost effective. Right now, we're more pricing of the premium meats really to build the brand and build the story. But over the next several years, the cost will be coming down extremely fast and um, overall economics are much better than meat. I've seen some research that indicates that the bulk of people are willing to pay more because of all the good side effects but not that much more. And so to really hit the mass market, being close on that price point is a key, key criteria. And the whole platform was developed around that, is it has to be scalable to hit a cost point in the market that will get the mass consumer over under the premise that, we use the premise that they're not going to pay any more. Now, there is research that does show that they will pay more. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to you. Thanks to Beyond Meat. And as I say in the break, Beyond will serve all of you with any luck at all. FFF. Right here. We're going to get a friend. Right here. Good job. Good job, guys. Actually, can I, can I have that burger? I'm going to take it. Okay, one second. All right. <laughs> okay, this is good. Thank you, Moses. Thank you. Thank you.